here with another interview. This with this time with uh, Kim Stedman, uh, NASA JPL. Uh, uh, welcome to our collective shows. <laughs> well, thank you, Bert. Thank you very much. Uh, first question. Okay. Uh, first, if if there's a space mission, you seem to have had your fingerprints in it to some degree. How did that work? Was that just luck? And and you got to touch so many different missions. Well, I guess it is luck, because uh, JPL hired me, and uh, the first mission I was working on actually got canceled. And then I went to Cassini, and I was there for about 15 years, and then I went to, at some point, went to MER, the Mars Exploration Rovers, and worked on Spirit and Opportunity, but mostly Opportunity, and then uh, to Curiosity and Perseverance. So, What's some of your education background? I got my bachelor's and master's in aerospace engineering at Georgia Tech. So, um, and your official job title, systems engineer, what, to people who don't know, what is, what is that? <laughs> well, the systems engineer is, I like to call it the captain of the starship. Um, we have to know what everyone's job is to a, a, enough of an extent that if this subsystem has a problem, then I know that it affects this subsystem, that subsystem, and that instrument. And so, as a systems engineer, you work the problems that go across um, the, oh my gosh, what is it called? They go across the, um, the different, or, yeah, the, the different organizations that are in the spacecraft. What was your first canceled mission? Well, it was a technology mission called X2000. And so the idea was that you would deliver this, this avionics hardware and, uh, to two or three different missions that were coming up. And, uh, and it, well, it's difficult, right? Because if a mission goes to Europa, and then the Jupiter system, there's all this radiation. But if you go to Mars, there's not that much radiation. And so it just never really worked. So does that mean that it's canceled and the thing that was there never never went into space or just hits to ride on a different... No, no, it, it was canceled and nothing ever happened. Huh. So that, that happens occasionally. What was your favorite mission? Uh, Opportunity Rover. That little rover was just amazing. She was supposed to last 90 days and she lasted 15 years. And it took a global dust storm that we hadn't seen in our lifetimes to take her out because she was uh, solar powered. And when you have a dust storm on Mars, it kicks a bunch of dust up in the atmosphere. And so if you were standing on Mars during a dust storm, it would look like dark. Hmm. So no light gets through. And so for a solar powered rover, that's really bad. What made you want to get into the field you're in? Oh my gosh, Star Trek. I, I grew up watching reruns of the original series of Star Trek, and then in 1977, I went to see Star Wars. I'm like, I have to do this. Yeah, that's, that's, Star Trek has been a common uh, answer, like all the scientists that we've Yep, seen. yep. What's um, your favorite thing that was sci-fi when you were a child that is now sci-reality? <laughs> well, I always wanted to beam down, but we don't, we don't get to do that. But then when you get to the next generation and they have the... The, the pads and everything and then now we have the iPads and the phone you know because at first the, there were flip phones like just like the communicators and so having the phone that can give me all the information is like the best thing ever that's yeah, like science inspires art that which in turn like the art inspires <laughs> yeah <laughs> it, science. yeah they forward-thinking people write these science fiction shows and a lot of what they envision comes to pass the Sherlock instruments mm -hmm. and you're by that, that that threw me for a loop and I didn't understand it well that's okay because I probably don't understand it either what is it what is it basically in theory well uh, it's a Raman spectrometer and so what it does I was the operations lead for the Sherlock instrument and so my job on the Sherlock instrument was to make sure that once we got to Mars we could actually command the instrument and we had the procedures and processes in place to do uplink and downlink but it fires a laser and it's a donut laser, so um, if you have a lot of dust and you fire the laser, then you can see that it's in a circle. And so the laser hits the ground, and then it reflects. Yes, and then it reflects back up, and then the spectrometer can tell you sort of what that rock's made out of. And the reason that we took the Raman spectrometer was because we're looking for past signs of life, and that's a really good instrument to do that. So it, it, it kicks up dust by a laser? Well, it doesn't really kick up the dust. It fires the laser at the rock, and then it reflects back. Okay. 
And so uh, we like the rock to be clear of dust. Otherwise, you're just going to be finding out what the dust is made of. And what we want to know is what the rock is made out of. And how far down could you look when you turned on that instrument? Well, the instrument gets really, really close to the surface. Um, so before we use Sherlock or Pixel, which are both on the arm of the rover, we do an abrade patch usually, which is a little, it makes a 11 millimeter deep circle. Uh, so we've cut into the rock so we don't get the, yeah, and, but it's about this big around. And uh, so that we get the interior of the rock, not just the exterior that's been in the weather for, for you know, probably millions of years. So, and that's how, yeah. And I don't know much else about how it works. So, because I'm an engineer. Uh, finding a way of life on Mars. Okay, can you repeat that? Are the rovers um, finding... Uh, a sign of life. Well, that's what we're looking for. So the Curiosity rover, well, the Mars exploration rovers were kind of like follow the water, find the, figure out the history of water on, on Mars. And then Curiosity, her big thing was to find out, was Mars ever habitable? Did all the conditions necessary for life to form, were they ever on Mars? And she found out, yes. And so then you send Perseverance to look for, among other things, past signs of life. So we're looking for a little bio, you know, proof that maybe six million years ago there was some life on Mars. But we haven't found anything yet. No doom portals, anything of that effect? No, and, and no little uh, Martians running in front of the rover holding up signs yet. We all wait for that. What, um, what are you currently working on? Well, currently I am a tactical uplink lead on the Perseverance rover. And I'm also a group supervisor. So as a group supervisor, I'm in charge of a group of people that do planning and sequencing for surface missions. So I have 20 people that directly report to me. How, uh, some we, we asked, how, because it takes so long from what you like, you know, start a mission to like the mission being in progress, that technology kind of changes after it already leaves your hands. like. What is the challenge of dealing with like you know technology that is now 10, 15 years old? Because uh, it takes that long to you know get to the the actual start of the mission. Well, the the technology on the spacecraft aren't the problem. It's the technology on Earth that is the challenge. Because when I worked on the Cassini mission, it lasted so long because it took Cassini many years to just get to to Saturn. I almost said Jupiter, thinking of Clipper, um, to get there, and then we operated her for so long that all of our software for building some of the, the sequences ran on sun machines. And eventually they didn't make those machines anymore. You couldn't go buy spare parts for them. So what the people, the, the ground people that uh, kept our machines running had to do was go to eBay and buy used sun machines and then, you know, take them apart for, and use them for spare parts. Yeah, no one thinks about that part of the Yeah, of the mission. yeah, like, no. It's like technology here on Earth is advancing, and like, no, we still need the, that you know, yeah, yeah. old system. To, to because to, to rewrite all your ground software to run on new machines, that takes a lot of money. And when you get out of your prime mission, money is very scarce. And the prime mission on that one, because, because um, the, the, what was the thing that you just said? The thing that lasted 15 years. Oh, opportunity. Because that, that, that wasn't supposed to be, that, I see what you're saying now. That was supposed to last how long? 90 sols. Okay, lasted much longer. Yeah. Very basic question, tactical uplink. What is that? So um, when we deal with our spacecraft, we have uplink and downlink. Uplink is you're preparing all the sequences and files to go to the spacecraft to tell the spacecraft what to do. To go, so it's going from Earth to where it is. Right, to the spacecraft for, for Perseverance, to Perseverance sitting on Mars. We can send files oh. and sequences directly to her. Downlink is getting data from the spacecraft and figuring out what happened. So usually it's a you know pretty standard process. Oh, here we got all the images that we needed, but oh, this one was only a partial, so we're gonna need to retransmit that to get it again. Mm -hmm. Or, and then you look at um, how all your uh, devices are doing and you do trending to make sure that like the uh, motors on the arm aren't degrading. And so it's, 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 I call it the news. So downlink is what happened. Oh, and yeah. they look at all the information that comes down and say, okay, so everything that you planned yesterday worked except for this one image and it's not down, but we'll get it down tomorrow. And so, yeah. 
And they call it tactical uplink because we all come in like at 8 a.m. is our normal stock start time. And you look at what came down from the rover yesterday. What have the scientists planned ahead of time? What, what is the goal for today's plan? And then you build all the sequences and files that uh, will be radiated to the spacecraft later that day. So on average, how long does that data transfer and everything take? Oh, well, I mean, how long does it take to get there? Uh, just, you know, if you, you, know, if like you need to tell it to do something, how long is like from that? Well, we usually only have half an hour uh, to send the files to the rover. But our planning day to build everything, uh, it goes from about six to 10 hours, depending on what we're doing and how persnickety our tools are. But every day at 9.30 a.m. on Mars, we send sequences and files to the rover. It's pretty awesome, 30 minutes and that's done. Yeah, well you just, yeah, it takes about 30 it's minutes. That's longer than that. Sometimes, <laughs> well yeah, and a lot of times we have a lot left over. Because if we're sending it 2,000 bits per second, then it gets up there pretty darn quick. What advice do you have for high schoolers, middle schoolers that want to get into the science fields? Well, I think that take uh, all the classes you can. And what I tell people is a lot of people are like, I want to do exactly this. But you know, that may not be where you should be. So keep your eyes open and take advantage of any opportunity to do something that maybe isn't this, but it's adjacent. And then find what you really love because everybody's like, I want to work on a spacecraft. Well, there's a lot of things you can do on a spacecraft. You can write the software for the spacecraft. You can build the parts for the base spacecraft. You can put the spacecraft together. You can operate the spacecraft after she's up there. So you have to narrow it down to really what do you want to do and what fits you. Because you have to be in a job that really fits you so that you can, you know, be awesome. Oh, you, you've made the work with the rovers and all that. It, is there still like a reason to put like a human there? I mean, are, are we getting all the all the signs we can from our, our robot friends? Or is well, it, I, I mean, you know, they, I think the Apollo missions, that's one thing that they did show us is that when you have a human there, then they can they can do magic because once they uh, train the Apollo astronauts to think like a geologist, they made some really fantastic discoveries. And our rover, we can make her smarter, and we can tell her, we're looking for this kind of rock that kind of looks like this, and, and we want to shoot the supercam with it. And you know, after a drive, she can select the target and shoot supercam. But it's very limited, and, and a human can just make those decisions you know, with their knowledge, they, they can make the decisions better than the rover can. But it's a lot easier to get the rover there. And the rover, she can, stay can, a lot longer. she can stay a lot longer. And right now, we don't have a way to safely get humans from here to there. Because you're exposed to a lot of radiation and all, all this kind of stuff that is not good for our human bodies just in the trip to get there. Do you think that'll really happen where people will ever be on Mars? Oh, I think so. So, Not in my lifetime, but I think it'll happen. So Mars is uh, filled with a lot of radiation? Well, uh, it doesn't have an atmosphere or a magnetic field like we do. And so the, if, once you're on the surface there, you just don't have much protection. So you would have to have something to protect you. Like a, you'd have to take a building or you would have to go underground or do something like that to protect yourself. Is NASA thinking of building... Uh, uh, shelter there on Mars? Uh, they find a way to... Well, not at this moment. There, uh, right now, as far as I know, there's no human space flight planned to Mars. They're trying to get there. To Mars? Yeah, they're, tra they're, they're trying to get to where they can send humans to Mars, but I think the next journey for NASA with human space flight is to the moon. They're going back to the moon. Can a planet like Mars naturally create an atmosphere? No. No, its atmosphere was stripped away a long time ago. Okay, remember, engineer, not scientist, but I know it doesn't have one now. It, it has a very, very thin, thin atmosphere. So, uh, Mars, how long would a human last on Mars if there's no protection? You're not going to last very long. You're not even going to get there. You're not going to get there, dude. So. Um, you said we're probably going back to the moon. What's... What's new that we need to learn there that we've not kind of previously? Yeah, now you're, you're talking almost, something, something uh, that I don't really have a lot of knowledge of because uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is uh, the leader in robotic exploration. 
And so I haven't worked on Artemis or any of those plans. So uh, I would have to Google that to see exactly what their plans are. What's kind of next for you? your department? Like, what, what's the thing on the horizon you're looking forward to, like, getting into? Well, I mean, at JPL, we have a couple things going on. I think you guys might have talked to Trina, right? But we have Europa Clipper coming up, and that's going to be really exciting. That launches within the next year. And, um, and we're hoping uh, for more sample return to happen. And because uh, Perseverance is collecting samples for, an, hopefully, an eventual return to Earth because our laboratories in here that are here are so much better than what we can put on a rover and send it to Mars. And so that's what we're hoping for. That's the first time we've gotten something physically back. It would be the first time that we got something physically back from a planet. Yes, and that, it's exciting. Get goosebumps thinking about it. Uh, I'm hoping it will, yeah. <laughs> I'm hoping it will happen um, because Perseverance is taking the samples and uh, we're storing the samples inside the rover. We did take 10 samples and drop them on Mars to create a, a sample depot. So in case something happens to Perseverance and she can't deliver the samples to a sample return lander, then at least they can go and get the samples that we've dropped on Mars. Wow. I think What's the thing that people need to know about the NASA, uh, NASA museum, the rocket center in Huntsville? Oh my What's, God. Because we, we spent some time there this past yeah. summer. You went to space camp there. What's the thing that tourists need to know about this facility that they might otherwise skip? Well, okay, you, I work in California. I, oh, I don't, I yeah. in Huntsville. No, sorry. no, it's in Pasadena, California. Okay. And so, uh, so, yeah, I'm not sure. I haven't been to Huntsville since I was in graduate school. Yeah. But I love going down to Kennedy Space Center, which is an amazing place, and they have a, a space shuttle on, on view there. And also in California, we have one of the space shuttles. And uh, yeah, and yeah, it was amazing how they got that there. But um, they're also building, uh, they have the only external tank and two solid rocket boosters. Of course, there's no propellant in them. And so the way that California Science Center is going to display their shuttle is like it's ready for launch, like it's on the pad. Oh, like it's straight up. It's going to be straight up. And they've started ground, they've broken ground on building that, that building. But I think their plan is to build part of the building and then put the shuttle in there and then build the rest of it around it. Around it. Yeah. I could be wrong about that, but, but I know it's going to be stored standing up, which is going to be amazing. I think we're about at our time limit. Uh, where can people follow what, uh, what y'all do, keep up with the, everything JPL and, and Mars? Oh, yeah, you can go to jpl.nasa.gov, and all of our missions are there. Perseverance has her own website, and the images that come down from the rover they almost immediately go on the raw images website. So you can see things literally minutes after the scientists themselves see them. It's really awesome.